The Road to Bear Creek by Robert Howard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Road to Bear Creek by Robert Howard. When Pat gets rheumatism, he gets remorseful. I remember one time particular. He says to me, him laying on his bar skin with a jug of corn liquor at his elbow, he says, Breckenridge, the sins of my youth is right and my conscience heavy. When I was a young man, I was free and careless in my habits, as numerous tombstones on the boundless prairies testifies. I sometimes wonders if I weren't a trifle hasty in shooting some of the men which disagreed with my principles. Maybe I should have controlled my temper and just chawed their ears off. Take Uncle Esau Grimes, for instance. And then Pap hove a sigh like a bull and took a drink and said, I ain't seen Uncle Esau for years. Me and him parted with harsh words and gun smoke. I've often wondered if he still holds a grudge against me for planting that charge of buckshot in his hind leg. What about Uncle Esau? I said. Pat produced a letter and said, He was brung to my mind by this here letter which Jib Braxton fotched me from war paint. It's from my sister Elizabeth back in Devilville, Arizona, where Uncle Esau lives. She says Uncle Esau's on his way to California and is due to pass through war paint about August the 10th. That's tomorrow. She don't know whether he intends turning off to see me or not, but suggests that I meet with him at war paint and make peace with him. Well, I demanded, because from the way Pap combed his beard with his fingers and eyed me, I knowed he was aiming to call on me to do something for him. Which same he was. Well, said Pap, taking a long swig out of the jug. I want you to meet the stage tomorrow morning at war paint and invite Uncle Esau to come up here and visit us. Now don't take no for an answer. Uncle Esau is as cranky as hell and a peculiar old duck, but I think he'll like a fine upstanding young man as big as you be, especially if you keep your mouth shut as much as possible and don't expect your ignorance. But I ain't never seen Uncle Esau, I protested. How am I going to know him? He ain't a big man, said Pat. Last time I seen him, he had a right smart growth of red whiskers. You bring him home regardless. Don't pay no attention to his belly aching. He's a peculiar old cuss, like I said, and awful suspicious, cause he's got lots of enemies. He burnt plenty of powder in his younger days, all the way from Texas to California. He was mixed up in more feuds and range wars than any man I ever knowed. He's supposed to have considerable money hid away somewheres, but that ain't got nothing to do with us. I wouldn't take his blasted money as a gift. All I want is to talk to him and get his forgiveness for filling his hide with buckshot in a moment of youthful passion. If he don't forgive me, said Pat, taking another pull at the jug, I'll bend my forty-five over his stubborn old skull. Now get going. So I saddled Captain Kidd and hid out across the mountains, and the next morning found me eating breakfast just outside of war paint. I didn't go right into the town because I was very bashful in them days being quite young and scared of sheriffs and things. But I'd stopped with old Bill Polk, an old hunter and trapper which was camped temporary at the edge of town. Warpaint was a new town which had sprung up out of nothing on account of a small gold rush right recent, and old Bill was very bitter. A hell of a come-off this is, he snorted, cluttering up the scenery and scaring the animals off with their fool houses and claims, Last year I shot a deer right where their main saloon is now, he said, glaring at me like it was my fault. I said nothing but chawed my venison which we was cooking over his fire, and he said, No good'll come of it, you mark my words. These mountains won't be fit to live in. 
These camps draw scums like a dead horse draws buzzards. Already the outlaws is riding in from Arizona and Utah, besides the native ones. Grizzly Hawkins and his thieves is hiding up in the hills, and no telling how many more'll come in. I'm glad they catched Badger Chisholm and his gang after they robbed that bank at Gunstock. That's one gang which won't be devilous, because they're in jail. If somebody just killed Grizzly Hawkins now... About that time I seen the stagecoach fogging it down the road from the east in a cloud of dust. So I saddled Captain Kidd and left old Bill gorging deer meat and prophesying disaster and damnation, and I rode into war paint just as the stage pulled up at the stand, which was also the post office and a saloon. They was three passengers, and none of them was tenderfeet. Two was big, hard-looking fellows, and t'other'n was a wiry, oldish kind of bird with reddish whiskers, so I knowed right off it was Uncle Esau Grimes. They was going into the saloon as I dismounted the big men first, and the older feller follerin em. I touched him on the shoulder, and he whirled most amazing quick with a gun in his hand, and he looked at me very suspicious and said, What you want? I'm Breckenridge Elkins, I said. I want you to come with me. I recognized you as soon as I seen you. I then got an awful surprise, but not as awful as it would have been if Pap hadn't warned me that Uncle Esau was peculiar. He hollered, Bill, Jim, help, and swung his six-shooter against my head with all his might. Them two fellows whirled and their hands streaked for their guns, so I knocked Uncle Esau flat to keep him from getting hit by a stray slug and shot one of them through the shoulder before he could unlimber his artillery. The other engrazed my neck with a bullet, so I perforated him in the arm and again in the hind leg, and he fell down across the other. I was careful not to shoot him in no vital parts, cause I seen they was friends of Uncle Esau. But when guns is being drawn, it ain't no time to argue or explain. Men was hollering and running out of saloons, and I stooped and started to lift Uncle Esau, who was kind of groggy cause he'd hit his head against a hitching post. He was crawling around on his all fours, cussing something terrible, and trying to find his gun, which he dropped. When I laid hold on him, he commenced biting and kicking and hollering, and I said, Don't act like that, Uncle Esau. Here comes a lot of fellers, and the sheriff might be here any minute and rest me for shooting them idiots. We got to get going. Pap is waiting for you up on Bear Creek. But he just fit that much harder and hollered that much louder. So I scooped him up bodily and jumped on to Captain Kidd and throwed Uncle Esau face down across the saddle bow and headed for the hills. A lot of men yelled at me to stop and some of them started shooting at me, but I give no heed. I gave Captain Kidd the rein and we went tearing down the road and around the first bend and I didn't even take time to change Uncle Esau's position because I didn't want to get arrested. I'd heard tell them folks in war paint would even put a fellow in jail for shooting a man within the city limits. Just before we reached the place where I aimed to turn off up into the hills, I seen a man on the road ahead of me, and he must have heard the shooting and Uncle Esau yelling, because he whirled his horse and blocked the road. He was a wiry old cuss with gray whiskers. Where are you going with that man? he yelled as I approached at a thundering gate. None of your business, I retorted. Get out of my way. Help, help, hollered Uncle Esau. I'm being kidnapped and murdered. Drop that man, you derned outlaw, roared the stranger, suiting his actions to his words. Him and me drawed simultaneous, but my shot was a split second quicker than his'n. His slug fanned my ear, but his hat flew off and he pitched out of his saddle like he'd been hit with a hammer. I seen a streak of red along his temple as I thundered past him. Let that learn you not to interfere in family affairs, I roared, and turned up the trail that switched off the road and up into the mountains. Don't never yell like that, I said irritably to Uncle Esau. You like to got me shot. That fella thought I was a criminal. I did catch what he said, but I looked back and down over the slopes and shoulders and seen men boiling out of town full tilt. 
and the sun glinted on six shooters and rifles, so I urged Captain Kidd, and we covered the next several miles at a fast clip. They ain't a horse in southern Nevada which can equal Captain Kidd for endurance, speed, and strength. Uncle Esau kept trying to talk, but he was bouncing up and down, so all I could understand was his cuss words, which was free and fervent. At last he gasped, For God's sakes, let me get off this cussed saddle horn. It's rubbing a hole in my belly. So I pulled up and seen no sign of pursuers, so I said, All right, you can ride in the saddle and I'll sit on behind. I was going to hire you a horse at the livery stable, but we had to leave so quick there weren't no time. Where are you taking me? he demanded. To Bear Creek, I said. Where you think? I don't want to go to Bear Creek, he said fiercely. I ain't going to Bear Creek. Yes, you are too, I said. Pap said not to take no for an answer. I'm going to slide over behind the saddle and you can sit in it. So I pulled my feet out of the stirrups and moved over the cantle and he slid into the seat and the first thing I knowed he had a knife out of his boot and was trying to carve my gizzard. Now I like to humor my relatives, but they is a limit to everything. I'd taken the knife away from him, but in the struggle, me being handicapped by not wanting to hurt him, I lost hold of the reins, and Captain Kidd bolted and run for several miles through the pines and brush, what with me trying to grab the reins and keep Uncle Esau from killing me at the same time, neither one of us in the stirrups, finally we both fell off. And if I hadn't managed to catch hold of the bridle as I went, we'd had a long walk ahead of us. I got Captain Kidd stopped after being drugged for several yards, and then I went back to where Uncle Esau was laying on the ground, trying to get his wind back, because I would kind of fell on him. Is that any way to act? trying to stick a knife in a man which is doing his best to make you comfortable i said reproachfully all he done was gasp so i said well pap told me you was a cranky old duck so i reckon the thing to do is just to not notice your uh eccentricities i looked around to get my bearings because captain kidd had got away off the trail that runs from war paint to bear creek we was west of the trail in very wild country but I seen a cabin off through the trees, and I said, We'll go over there and see if I can hire or buy a horse for you to ride. That'll be more convenient for us both. I started heisting him back into the saddle, and he said, kind of dizzily, This here's a free country. I don't have to go to Bear Creek if and I don't want to. Well, I said severely, you ought to want to, after all the trouble I've went to coming and inviting you. Set still now. I'm sitting on behind, but I'm holding the reins. I'll have your life for this, he promised bloodthirstily, but I ignored it because Pap had said Uncle Esau was peculiar. Pretty soon we hove up to the cabin I'd glimpsed through the trees. Nobody was in sight, but I seen a horse tied to a tree in front of the cabin. I rode up to the door and knocked, but nobody answered but I seen smoke coming out of the chimney, so I decided I'd go in. I dismounted and lifted Uncle Esau off because I seen from the gleam in his eye that he was intending to run off on Captain Kidd if I give him half a chance. I got a firm grip on his collar because I was determined that he was going to visit us up on Bear Creek if I had to tote him on my shoulder all the way, and I went into the cabin with him. There wasn't nobody in there, though a pot of beans was simmering over some coals in the fireplace, and I seen some rifles in racks on the wall and a belt with two pistols hanging on a nail. Then I heard somebody walking behind the cabin, and the back door opened and there stood a big black whiskered man with a bucket of water in his hand and an astonished glare on his face. He didn't have no guns on. Who the hell are you? he demanded. But Uncle Esau gave a kind of gurgle and said, Grizzly Hawkins. The big man jumped and glared at Uncle Esau, and then his black whiskers bristled in a ferocious grin, and he said, Oh, it's you, is it? Who'd a thunk I'd ever meet you here? Grizzly Hawkins, eh? I said, realizing that I'd stumbled onto the hideout of the worst outlaw in them mountains. So you all know each other? 
I'll say we do, rumbled Hawkins, looking at Uncle Esau like a wolf looks at a fat yearling. I'd heard you was from Arizona, I said, being naturally tactful. Looks to me like they's enough cow thieves in these hills already without outsiders butting in. But your morals ain't none of my business. I want to buy or hire or borrow a horse for this here gent to ride. Oh, no, you ain't, said Grizzly. You think I'm going to let a fortune slip through my fingers like that? Tell you what I'll do, though. I'll split with you. My gang had business over toward Tomahawk this morning, but they're due back soon. Me and you will work him over before they gets back, and we'll nab all the loot ourselves. What you mean, I asked. My uncle and me is on our way to Bear Creek. I don't act innocent with me, he snorted disgustedly. Uncle, you think I'm a plumb fool? Can't I see he's your prisoner the way you got him by the neck? Think I don't know what you're up to? Be reasonable. Two can work this job better than one. I know lots of ways to make a man talk. I bet you if we kind of massage his hinder parts with our red-hot branding iron, he'll tell us quick enough where the money's hid. Uncle Esau turned pale under his whiskers, and I said indignantly, Why, you low-life polecat, you got the crust to pretend to think I'm kidnapping my own uncle for his dough? i got a good mind to shoot you. So you're greedy, huh? He snarled, showing his teeth. Want all the loot to yourself, huh? I'll show you. Quick as a cat, he swung that water bucket over his head and let it go at me. I ducked, and it hit Uncle Esau in the head and stretched him out, all drenched with water. And Hawkins gave a roar and dived for a forty-five ninety on the wall. He wheeled with it, and I shot it out of his hands. He then come for me, wild-eyed, with a buoy out of his boot, and my next cartridge snapped, and he was on top of me before I could cock my gun again. I dropped my gun and grappled with him, and we fit all over the cabin, and every now and then we'd trample on Uncle Esau, which was trying to crawl toward the door, and the way he would holler was pitiful to hear. Hawkins lost his knife in the melee, but he was as big as me in a bear cat at rough and tumble. We'd stand up and wail away with both fists, and then clinch and roll around the floor, biting and gouging and slugging. And once we rolled clean over Uncle Esau and kind of flattened him out like a pancake. Finally Hawkins got hold of the table, which he lifted like it was a board, and splintered over my head. And this made me mad, so I grabbed the pot off the fire and hit him in the head with it and about a gallon of red-hot beans went down his back, and he fell into a corner so hard he jolted the shelves loose from the logs, and all the guns fell off the walls. He come up with a gun in his hand, but his eyes was so full of blood and hot beans that he missed me the first shot, and before he could shoot again, I hit him on the chin so hard it fractured his jawbone and sprained both his ankles and stretched him out cold. Then I looked around for Uncle Esau, and he was gone, and the front door was open. I rushed out of the cabin, and there he was, just climbing aboard Captain Kidd. I hollered for him to wait, but he kicked Captain Kidd in the ribs and went tearing through the trees, only he didn't head north back toward war paint. He was pinted southeast in the general direction of Hideout Mountain. I jumped on Hawkins' horse, which was tied to a tree nearby, and lit out after him, though I didn't have much hope of catching him. Grizzly's cayuse was a good horse, but he couldn't hold a candle to Captain Kidd. I wouldn't have caught him neither, if it hadn't been for Captain Kidd's distaste of being rode by anybody but me. Uncle Esau was a crack horseman to stay on as long as he did. But finally Captain Kidd got tired of running, and about the time he crossed the trail we'd been following when he first bolted, he bogged his head and started busting himself in two, with his snoot rubbing the grass and his heels scraping the clouds off of the sky. I could see mountain peaks between Uncle Esau and the saddle, and when Captain Kidd started sunfishing, it looked like the wrath of Judgment Day. But somehow Uncle Esau managed to stay with him 
till Captain Kidd plumb left the earth like he aimed to aviate from then on, and Uncle Esau left the saddle with a shriek of despair and sailed head on into a blackjack thicket. Captain Kidd gave a snort of contempt and trotted off to a patch of grass and started grazing, and I dismounted and went and untangled Uncle Esau from amongst the branches. His clothes was tore and he was scratched, so he looked like he'd been fighting with a drove of wildcats, and he left a right smart batch of his whiskers among the brush. But he was full of pison and hostility. I understand this here treatment, he said bitterly, like he blamed me for Captain Kidd pitching him into the thicket. But you'll never get a penny. Nobody but me knows where the dough is, and you can pull my toenails out by the roots before I tells you. I know you got money hid away, I said, deeply offended, but I don't want it. He snorted skeptically and said sarcastic, Then what are you dragging me over these cussed hills for? Cause Pap wants to see you, I said, but they ain't no use in asking me a lot of fool questions. Pap said for me to keep my mouth shut. I looked around for Grizzly's horse and seen he'd wandered off. He sure hadn't been trained proper. Now I gotta go look for him, I said disgustedly. Will you stay here till I get back? Sure, he said. Sure. Go on and look for the horse. I'll wait here. But I give him a searching look and shook my head. I don't want to seem like I mistrust you, I said but I see a gleam in your eye which makes me believe you intends to run off the minute my back's turned. I hate to do this, but I got to bring you safe to Bear Creek, so I'll just kind of hog-tie you with my lariat till I get back. Well, he put up an awful holler, but I was firm, and when I rode off on Captain Kidd I was satisfied that he couldn't untie them knots by himself. I left him laying in the grass beside the trail, and his language was awful to listen to. That derned horse had wandered further than I thought. He'd moved north along the trail for a short wave and turned off and headed in a westerly direction, and after a while I heard the sound of horses galloping somewhere behind me, and I got nervous, thinking that if Hawkins' gang had got back to their hideout and he had told them about us and sent them after us, to capture poor Uncle Esau and torture him to make him tell where his savings was hid. I wished I'd had sense enough to shove Uncle Esau back in the thicket so he wouldn't be seen by anybody riding along the trail, and I'd just decided to let the horse go and turn back when I seen him grazing among the trees ahead of me. I headed back for the trail, leading him, aiming to hit it a short distance north of where I'd left Uncle Esau and before I got in sight of it I heard horses and saddles creaking ahead of me. I pulled up on the crest of a slope and looked down onto the trail, and there I seen a gang of men riding north, and they had Uncle Esau amongst them. Two of the men was riding double, and they had him on a horse in the middle of them. They took the ropes off him, but he didn't look happy. Instantly I realized my premonitions was correct. The Hawkins gang had followed us, and now poor Uncle Esau was in their clutches. I let go of Hawkins' horse and reached for my gun, but I didn't dare fire for fear of hitting Uncle Esau. They was clustered so close about him. I reached up and tore a limb off an oak tree as big as my arm, and I charged down the slope, yelling, I'll save you, Uncle Esau! I come so sudden and unexpected them fellows didn't have time to do nothing but holler before I hit em. Captain Kidd plowed through their horses like an avalanche through saplings, and he was going so hard I couldn't check him in time to keep him from knocking Uncle Esau's horse sprawling. Uncle Esau hit the turf with a shriek. All around me men was yelling and surging and pulling guns, and I riz in my stirrups and laid about me right and left, and pieces of bark and oak leaves and blood flew in showers and in a second the ground was littered with writhing figures, and the groaning and cussing was awful to hear. Knives was flashing and pistols was banging, but them outlaws' eyes was too full of bark and stars and blood for them to aim, and right in the middle of the brawl, when the guns was roaring and men was yelling and horses neighing, 
and my oak limb going crack, crack on human skulls. Down from the north swooped another gang, howling like hyenas. There he is, one of them yelled. I see him crawling around under them horses. After him, boys, we got as much right to his dough as anybody. The next minute they dashed in amongst us and embraced the members of the other gang and started hammering them over the heads with their pistols. And in a second was the damnedest three-cornered war you ever seen. Men fighting on the ground and on the horses, all mixed and tangled up, two gangs trying to exterminate each other, and me wailing hell out of both of them. Now, I have been mixed up in ruckuses like this before, despite the fact that I'm a peaceful and easy-going feller which never done harm to man or beast unless provoked beyond reason. I always figure the best thing to do in a brawl is to hold your temper, and I done just that. When this one feller fired a pistol plumb in my face and singed my eyebrows, I didn't get mad. When this other and come from somewhere to start biting my leg, I only picked him up by the scruff of the neck and knocked a horse over with him. But I must have lost control a little, I guess, when two fellers at once started bashing at my head with rifle butts. I swung at them so hard, I turned Captain Kidd plumb around and my club broke, and I had to grab a bigger and tougher one. Then I really laid into him. Meanwhile, Uncle Esau was on the ground under us, yelling bloody murder and being stepped on by the horses. But finally I cleared a space with a devastating sweep of my club, and leaned down and scooped him up with one hand, and hung him over my saddle horn and started battering my way clear. But a big fellow, which is one of the second gang, came charging through the melee, yelling like an engine, with blood running down his face from a cut in his scalp. He snapped an empty cartridge at me, then leaned out from his saddle and grabbed Uncle Esau by the foot. Let go, he howled. He's my meat. Release Uncle Esau before I does you an injury, I roared, trying to jerk Uncle Esau loose. But the outlaw hung on, and Uncle Esau squalled like a catamount in a wolf trap. So I lifted what was left of my club and splintered it over the outlaw's head, and he gave up the ghost with a gurgle. I then wheeled Captain Kidd and rode off like the wind. Them fellows was too busy fighting each other to notice my flight. Somebody did let Bam at me with a Winchester, but all it done was nick Uncle Esau's ear. The sounds of carnage faded out behind us as I headed south along the trail. Uncle Esau was belly aching about something. I'd never seen such a cuss for finding fault, but I felt there was no time to be lost, so I didn't slow up for some miles. Then I pulled Captain Kidd down and said, What did you say, Uncle Esau? I'm a broken man, he gasped. Take my secret. Let me go back to the posse. All I want now is a good, safe prison term. What posse? I asked, thinking he must be drunk, though I couldn't figure where he got any booze. The posse you took me away from, he said. Anything's better than being dragged through these hellish mountains by a homicidal maniac. Posse, I gasped wildly. But who was the second gang? Grizzly Hawkins outlaws, he said and added bitterly, even they would be preferable to what I've been going through. I give up. I know when I'm licked. The doe's hid in a holler oak three miles south of Gunstock. I didn't pay no attention to his remarks, cause my head was in a whirl. A posse? Of course. The sheriff and his men had followed us from war paint along the Bear Creek Trail, and finding Uncle Esau tied up, had thought he'd been kidnapped by an outlaw, instead of merely being invited to visit his relatives. Probably he was too cussed ornery to tell him any different. I hadn't rescued him from no bandits. I took him away from a posse which thought they was rescuing him. Meanwhile, Uncle Esau was clamoring. Well, why don't you let me go? I told you where the dough is. What else you want? you got to go on to Bear Creek with me, I begun. 
and Uncle Esau give a shriek and went into a kind of convulsion, and the first thing I knowed he twisted around and jerked my gun out of its scabbard and let bam right in my face, so close it singed my hair. I grabbed his wrist, and Captain Kidd bolted like he always does when he gets a chance. "'They's a limit to everything!' I roared. "'A hell of a relative you be, you old maniac!' We was tearing over slopes and ridges at breakneck speed and fighting all over Captain Kidd's back. Me to get the gun away from him, and him to commit murder. If you weren't kin to me, Uncle Esau, I'd plumb lose my temper. What you keep calling me that fool name for? he yelled, frothing at the mouth. What you want to add insult to injury? Captain Kidd swerved sudden, and Uncle Esau tumbled over his neck. I had him by the shirt and tried to hold him on, but the shirt tore. He hit the ground on his head, and Captain Kidd run right over him. I pulled up as quick as I could, and hove a sigh of relief to see how close to home I was. We're nearly there, Uncle Esau, I said, but he made no comment. He was out cold. A short time later I rode up to the cabin with my eccentric relative slung over my saddle-bow and took him and stalked into where Pap was laying on his bar skin and slung my burden down on the floor in disgust. Well, here he is, I said. Pap stared and said, Who's this? When you wipe the blood off, I said, you'll find it's your uncle Esau Grimes. And, I added bitterly, the next time you want to invite him to visit us, you can do it yourself. A more ungrateful cuss I never seen. Peculiar ain't no name for him. He's as crazy as a loco jackass. But that ain't Uncle Esau, said Pap. What do you mean, I said irritably. I know most his clothes is tore off, and his face is kind of scratched and skinned and stomped out of shape, but you can see his whiskers is red in spite of the blood. Red whiskers turn gray. In time, said a voice, and I wheeled and pulled my gun as a man loomed in the door. It was a gray-whiskered old fellow I'd traded shots with on the edge of war paint. He didn't go for his gun, but stood twisting his mustache and glaring at me like I was a curiosity or something. "'Uncle Esau!' said Pap. "'What?' I hollered. "'Are you Uncle Esau?' "'Certainly I am,' he snapped. "'But you weren't on the stagecoach,' I begun. "'Stagecoach!' he snorted taking Pap's jug and beginning to pour liquor down the man on the floor. Them things is for women and children. I travel horseback. I spent last night in war paint and aimed to ride on up to Bear Creek this morning. In fact, Bill, he addressed Pap, I was on the way here when this young maniac creased me. He indicated a bandage on his head. "'You mean Breckenridge shot you?' ejaculated Pap. "'It seems to run in the family,' grunted Uncle Esau. "'But who's this?' I hollered wildly, pointing at the man I'd thought was Uncle Esau, and who was just coming to. "'I'm Badger Chisholm,' he said, grabbing the jug with both hands. "'I demands to be protected from this lunatic and turned over to the sheriff.' Him and Bill Reynolds and Jim Hopkins robbed a bank over at Gunstock three weeks ago, said Uncle Esau. The real one, I mean. A posse captured them, but they'd hid the loot somewhere and wouldn't say where. They escaped several days ago, and not only the sheriff was looking for them, but all the outlaw gangs, too, to find out where they'd hid their plunder. It was an awful big haul. They must have figured that escaping out of the country by stagecoach would be the last thing folks would expect them to do, and they weren't known in this part of the country. But I recognized Bill Reynolds when I went back to war paint to have my head dressed after you shot me, Breckenridge. The doctor was patching him and Hopkins up, too. The sheriff and a posse lit out after you, and I followed them when I got my head fixed. Of course, I didn't know who you was. I come up while the posse was fighting with Hawkins' gang, and with my help we corralled the whole bunch. Then I took up your trail again. 
pretty good day's work wiping out two of the worst gangs in the West. One of Hawkins' men said Grizzly was laid up in his cabin, and the posse was going to drop by for him. What you going to do about me? clamored Chisholm. Well, said Pap, we'll bandage your wounds, and I'll let Breckenridge here take you back to war paint. Hey, what's the matter with him? Badger Chisholm had fainted. End of the Road to Bear Creek